if you weren't with us last week, wasn't, uh, hopefully you, you watched it because we had a great celebration Sunday, last Sunday, and uh, baptizing four people, which was just a thrill. And, and so if you didn't catch last Sunday's service, I hope you will um, go online and, and watch that. And that kind of reminds me, if you're not a part of our weekly email that we send out every Thursday, then it'll be really hard for you to keep up with what's going on at the church. And so if you aren't a part of that weekly email, but you'd like to be, would you please take out a connect card and just write your name, your email address, and let us know. And that's the best way to catch the service from the week before is to be a part of that email list. Um, And so it was a great day. Wasn't it a good day last week? Yes, absolutely. If, If you faithfully read scripture long enough, if you really engage it and dive in and dig into it, then you are bound to eventually come to a place where you read a passage of scripture. And after you read that passage of scripture, you're going to be met with some confusion and some frustration and wonder to yourself, man, this can't be serious. If you read scripture long enough, you'll eventually come to some passages that you'll stumble upon and and some stories that you'll encounter and some proclamations that if you read them and take them at face value, they'll leave you wondering, does the author really understand real life at all? (laughs) See, if we're honest when we read scripture, we will at the very least certainly read passages that seem so far from the life that we actually live day in and day out that we'll wonder how they apply to us and how they can be true. If I'm honest with you today, the passage that we're about to look at, the passage that was already read in the worship service, is one of those passages for me. We've been diving deep into the book of Philippians this summer, and as we have, we've, we've discovered this beautiful letter that is written from a founding pastor, a church planter named Paul the Apostle. He had this experience with Jesus, and it changed his life forever, and he went from being Saul, who was the most devout of all the Jews, and persecuted Jesus and his followers, and he became Paul, who was this glorious church planter and responsible for many of the early churches and and their flourishing. And and this letter we've been reading in Philippians is Paul's letter to probably the church that he's most partial to, a church that just holds a special place in his heart. He loves this place. It's the church in Philippi, hence the book name Philippians. And Paul's writing this letter, remember, to his close friends in this church, but he's writing this letter from a Roman prison. He's actually in jail. And he delivers these words today, which are really the signature passage of Scripture on a topic that has just become uh, so talked about and so discussed and, and, and so hot in our culture. And that topic is one you'll recognize. It's the topic of anxiety. And this is what Paul tells this church that he loves so much. This is Paul's words for you and I to consider thousands of years later in a different context, but still these words matter to us in much the same way. This is what he says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What can Paul mean when he says, do not be anxious about anything? How could he say this to you and to me? He doesn't understand the world in which we live, does he? He doesn't understand what he's actually asking us to do. He has no idea the pressure that you and I are facing. He can't possibly understand the environments in which we are a part of, the environments in which we are raised, in our past, in our coping mechanisms. 
he doesn't fully know how much is expected of us, does he? He surely doesn't watch the news. He can't have the TV on at 10 o'clock or watching the cable news stations. He couldn't have had kids. He doesn't follow the stock market, does he? Or have a spouse or ever wanted a spouse or he's never been in school and faced deadlines and papers and finals and expectations there. He must not have had CNN.com or Google search or ever heard about global warming or experienced cancer or knew about terrorists who were after us. Because if he was in touch with any of this, he wouldn't dare say to us, do not be anxious about anything. Really? Paul, can we be real for a moment? Just this week, I was anxious about my health. Just this week, I was anxious about my finances. I was anxious about my kids going back to school. Just this week, I was anxious about my work performance and whether or not I was doing a good job. Just this week, I was really anxious about the results of my failure and how I hurt other people. And to be honest with you, there's probably a few more things that I didn't even list there that I felt anxious about. Maybe one of the easiest questions to ask somebody that you don't know and you're looking for serious conversation, maybe one of the easiest questions we could ask anyone these days is, what makes you anxious? In just a matter of seconds, people will call to mind the things that make them feel anxiety. It seems that in our culture, anxiety is less of this rare condition that just certain people struggle with, and it's more of this common, all-consuming companion of the human race. So what in the world does Paul mean when he says these words? Quite literally, do not be anxious about anything. Does anybody else find that hard to take at face value? Is it just me today? A few of you, a few of you. I know Paul isn't just out of touch with reality. I'm really confident of that. In fact, Paul wrote these words from inside a prison cell. He was facing capital charges, meaning his life was on the line. And, and just uh, probably days from when he writes this letter, he's going to find out what his fate will be, whether he will live or whether he will die. And he's writing these words to a church in Philippi who he's just talked about the inner struggle they're having, the relational struggle they're having. And not only is there struggle from within the church, but there's pressure and oppression from outside the church pushing in on the church walls. They may not have known about cancer or COVID or modern day war, but Paul and this church knew about insecurity and they knew about threats and they knew danger and discomfort. And it's from that very reality that Paul has the guts to say, do not be anxious about anything. From jail, facing capital charges, do not be anxious about anything. And could it be that when Paul tells us to not be anxious, when he gives us this command, that maybe he understands the difference between feeling anxious and being anxious? Maybe Paul isn't saying that we should never feel anxious. After all, it's really, really difficult to control what you feel. Have you figured that out? It's really hard to somehow filter out and, and contain the feelings that we have. The way we, off, the way we feel is often a result of the circumstances around us, what's happening in our environment, to feel scared and to feel worried, to feel in, unsure and unstable. That's all pretty natural. It happens to us every day. But Paul would say to us, even though you feel anxious, don't be anxious. Because here's the truth about anxiety. Anxiety quickly moves from just a feeling 
to a powerful force. Anxiety quickly moves from an emotion that happens to us to an emotion that takes control and drives us. If we aren't careful, anxiety moves from being just a feeling to taking the seat in the control center of our life. Anxiety will start barking out orders to you giving commands, and without any official permission, anxiety takes a seat of power and begins to influence our thinking and our attitudes and even our actions and decisions. So I wonder, when Paul speaks with such simple clarity not to be anxious, maybe he understands that we all feel anxious, but there's a difference between feeling anxious and being anxious. So don't give your anxiety a voice. Don't give your anxiety the power that it wants. Instead, Paul says, replace your anxiety with prayer. And this isn't just an exercise in removing our anxious feelings. This isn't just getting rid of the feelings of anxiety, but this is an activity in which we replace those feelings of anxiety with a different activity of prayer. See, some of us have become quite skilled in getting rid of anxiety and just not feeling anxious. But oftentimes what that does is it, it leaves all of our emotions a bit suppressed. And in order to make sure that we never feel anxious, we kind of push down anything that we can feel at all. We want to be calm, cool, and collected like nothing can bother us. But in order to do so, we kind of have to suppress everything else in our life to be dulled to life's passions, to become apathetic and lifeless and stoic, to ensure that anxiety isn't felt, we repress our emotions and our expectation is lowered. But Paul comes to us today and he says, I have a better way. I have a better way of dealing with your anxiety. And that that better way, he says, is, is to pray even in the midst of your anxiety. I so appreciate Eugene's, Eugene Peterson's interpretation here in his paraphrase of the scripture that he calls the message. He says, it's not just don't worry, but instead of worry, pray. See, this is huge. Paul isn't saying that the circumstances of your life and the circumstances of, of our world, that they're not so bad that you shouldn't worry about them you know, get over yourself. You know, sure, you just lost your job. Sure, you just lost a spouse. Sure, you're facing incredible financial pressure, but it's really not that big of a deal. Just don't worry about it. That's not what Paul's saying here. He's saying, in your worry, instead of worry, pray. He's saying that we serve a God that is much greater than any of the problems and obstacles we face. So when that feeling of anxiety hits you in your chest, may it be a neon light pointing you to the importance of prayer. John Wesley used to say, anxiety and prayer cannot stand together. Anxiety and prayer cannot stand together because prayer pushes anxiety out. It takes the remote control out of the hands of your anxious feelings. It unplugs the power source of your anxiety. Because your mission today, church, isn't to avoid ever feeling anxious again. It's to substitute your anxiety for prayer. Verse six, again, says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I thought it was really interesting here how Paul draws a picture and colors that picture of what prayer should be in our anxious moments. He uses this word petition, which if you look at the root of this word in the original language, it simply means to seek or to ask or even maybe to go so far as to beg. It's this posturing of, I need help. There's something beyond me, outside of me, something that I can't control, that I need your help. It's the idea of approaching somebody more powerful than you to meet your needs. It's dependence and submission. And more than that, Paul says to ask with 
thanksgiving. Ask with thanksgiving. When you pray, thank the Lord for what he's already done in your life, but also thank him for this moment in which you can come to him. But go further and thank him for what he's going to do in the future as well. In gratitude, posture yourself as dependent and needy before the Lord. And it's this type of prayer that dismantles anxiety. Anxiety is crushed when we are thankful. When we begin to to celebrate the goodness in our life, when we begin to focus on what God has already done for us, when we begin to sing God's promises or to journal our gratitude, anxiety and worry are crippled by blessing and God's faithfulness. So in those moments when you're feeling most anxious, what if you began to pray with thanksgiving for all the good that God has done? Start saying thank you. And and here's here's a, a practical truth that I've learned through many years of counseling for anxiety. I don't know if you know that about my story. I'm not gonna go into it all today, but I've lived a life that, has been drastically affected by anxiety. And uh, I started going to counseling when I was in third grade, and I've been to counseling as recently as uh, probably about a year ago, two years ago, for for anxiety. So I'm like right in the throes of this with you, okay? But here's the thing about anxiety. Anxiety thrives on either a real or perceived loss of control. When we feel like we have lost control of a situation or we don't have control or it's being taken from us, then anxiety kind of swells up and rises to the occasion. So Paul says, come to the Lord in prayer with petition. And here's the interesting thing. In other words, instead of feeling as though life has somehow taken your control out of the situation, what if we came to the Lord voluntarily before that we ever get to that point and say, Lord, I'm surrendering my control of this situation. I'm asking you to step in. I'm admitting to you before I ever feel powerless that I am powerless and that I serve a God who's going to step in and meet my every need. Instead of experiencing this real or perceived loss of control, Paul says, come to the Lord in trust and submission and give him control to begin with. You can cut off the fuel of anxiety when you voluntarily surrender your control and you choose to trust instead. Because in my experience, there's a few really helpful ways to combat or work against anxiety. One of those ways is rational thought. If you're an anxious person, you're really familiar with this phrase. This phrase begins, what if, right? And we have these thoughts that creep into our minds, what if? And we may not even recognize that that's what we're telling ourselves, but that is what we're telling ourselves. What if, fill in the blank. And one of the best ways to push back anxiety temporarily is to come against it with rational thought. So just follow through with the what-if statements in your head. What if what you're afraid of actually happens? And just begin to think rationally. This is the value of counseling. This is the value of of Christian friends and brothers and sisters who will come around you and, and help you to think clearly about your situation. And when we can think clearly about our situation, oftentimes we can push back our anxious feelings and thoughts. Another helpful tool in battling anxiety is distraction. If you can distract yourself from the thoughts that are consuming you, then anxiety can can subside a little bit. And so when we talk about being grateful and having gratitude, when we talk about having a sense of awe, maybe one of the best things you can do for your anxiety is to, to go to the edge of the ocean or into the mountains and just to look upon what God's created and be overcome by the sense of awe. See, this is, this is a distraction technique where it takes your mind from what is worrying you to something that is thrilling you or, or something that is consuming you in another way. But these are both temporary relief mechanisms for anxiety. And Paul would say to us today, I have 
a, a better and a deeper and a more full way for you to come against anxiety. And, and that is that you would actually trust that God is working on your behalf, that you are not alone, that he will bring about good in your situation. You see, to pray with thanksgiving and petition is to say, Lord, whatever you do in response to my prayer is good. Whatever you do in this situation in response to my seeking you, I will trust and I will thank you for it. I was in a, a, a seminar yesterday at the District Discipleship Day, and there was this, this lady who I'd never met before. Um, her name is Debbie Perkins, and she was talking about parenting and she talked about when she first got married that her and her husband were unable to have children for the first seven years, and she went to um, all the doctors, took all the medications, tried the special procedures, and nothing was working. And after seven years, she came to the Lord in this really, really honest prayer, and, and I'm paraphrasing what she said now, but basically the essence of her prayer was, Lord, I trust that you know better than me. And if your good and perfect will and direction for my life is that I would not have children. I trust you. I don't like it. I wouldn't prefer it. This isn't the way I would have chosen to do it. But if your good and perfect will for my life is that I would be a barren woman, help me to trust you. What a powerful prayer. What a powerful moment where she turned over her anxiety in thanksgiving and petition and prayer and said, God, I trust you. Because prayer is just that. It's confidence and trust in God's perfect plan. His good and very well-intentioned plan for your life. And church, isn't this the essence of Christianity? that we would come to greater and greater dependence upon God's will for our life, to fully and utterly trust the Lord, to be able to say with everything within you, not my will, but thine, to follow Christ no matter what the circumstances of your life come to be, to never act independently, but to seek to do only what the Spirit leads you to do. It's when we capture this kind of trust. It's when we're living in this kind of dependence in this prayerful state that anxiety is kicked from the control room of our lives. So Paul finishes by saying this really beautiful promise. He says in verse 7, if you'll pray with thanksgiving, if you'll present your request to God, then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Would you read this with me? The word of God is powerful. Let's, let's read this together. Verse seven, the, the part in the yellow here. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Notice that, notice what Paul doesn't say here. Notice that Paul doesn't say, and the power of God, will intervene and fix everything in your life that is broken and uncomfortable. Paul doesn't say that. Notice, he doesn't say, and the provision of God, if you'll just pray, if you'll bring your petition with thanksgiving and your anxiety pray, then the provision of God will intervene in your life and you will have no needs unmet. You will be comfortable and happy and satisfied. Paul isn't promising that if we pray, God will intervene and smooth out the road so that we have no reason to worry. He isn't promising a resolution to your problems. He isn't promising that you would understand what he is doing. Instead, he says, you will have peace. In the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of your disappointment, in the midst of your trial and struggle, struggle and grind, you will have peace. Peace that transcends all understanding. Oh, this is so good. Because fear and anxiety are the result of us not knowing. We fear the unknown. We 
worry about things that we don't uh, know the answer to, we don't understand, we can't figure out, we've never been there before. Yet Paul says that the peace of God comes from surrendering to him in prayerful surrender is beyond our understanding. In other words, his peace isn't the result of him explaining how it's all going to work out. See, we think that if we turn from our anxiety and that we pray with petition and thanksgiving, then God will somehow give us a vision of how it all works out. And once we get an understanding of how God will work in our circumstances, we will have peace. Thank you, Lord. And my hope is that that happens sometimes, okay? Don't get me wrong. God is incredibly kind and generous to us. Oftentimes, he'll give us a glimpse of our answer to our prayers. But your peace isn't the product of you understanding why you are facing what you're facing. Your peace isn't the result of figuring out an action plan and having a way to attack. The peace that God's promising transcends your understanding. It's not knowing better, it's trusting more. It's believing that even when you can't understand, God is worthy of your trust. Then peace comes in. I can't help but think about the difference between calming the anxiety of my youngest child, Brigham, and calming the anxiety of my oldest child, Beckett. Let's just say there's a tornado coming. Pretty common here in Oklahoma, right? (laughs) That's an anxious moment for most of us, a lot of us, because the power of the unknown, there's danger involved. And with my youngest child, who's now five, and he may be kind of growing out of this phase, But for my youngest child, the way I would comfort his anxiety is I would say, don't worry, I'm here, right? I'm with you. Don't worry, we're here. We're here, we're safe. And in those simple words, there's this dependence and trust and surrender that says, yes, I trust you. You're telling me we're safe. I'm with you. This is good. But with my older kids, there's already this longing that they understand more than trust. So with the older kids, I have to explain to them, well, here's the picture of the radar, and it's traveling at this speed, and it looks like it's going to miss our house by three miles. I think we'll be okay. Or I'll explain to them, we're in the center of our house, Even if a tornado hits us, chances are the whole structure won't collapse. We'll be safe in here. Or fill in the blank. I can go into helping them to understand that by taking precaution and having a plan that they are safe within that plan. Here's what I think Paul wants to tell us today. The magic of this statement, do not be anxious about anything, is that we would become like my youngest child who in our worry and anxiety were were not just somehow calmed and assured by understanding God's plan for our life, but we are calmed and assured because we trust in him, that he is good, that he is faithful, that he is worthy. And in that simple dependence and surrender, which Christ so desperately wants for us, our anxiety is displaced. But here's the sad state of affairs about us as Christ followers is that we often don't come to this place of surrender and find this type of peace voluntarily. We don't often get there until life forces us there. Life will push us into circumstances in which the only way we can ever have peace is because God grants it based on his goodness, because we could never understand why our family was taken from us. We can never understand why our marriage crippled and fell apart. We will never understand why our child passed before we passed. We could never understand why we face the kind of disease and sickness 
and struggle that we face. And in those moments, we experience a peace of God that transcends understanding. So Paul says, the invitation is open today. It's clear and compelling. We can forfeit our right to understand how everything is going to work out, and we can instead begin to live in prayerful harmony with Jesus. And as we do, Eugene Peterson again just nails it here. As we do, he describes it. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. See, some of us need to meditate on this scripture this week. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life, that we could experience surrender and trust. As we close today, I couldn't help but think of this encouraging verse of Scripture from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 26. This is the promise that Isaiah gives his people. He says, you, God, will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. So trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. That's your task today as kingdom people, as people of baptism, as Christ followers. May we voluntarily find ourselves Instead, fast trust in the Lord. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for the word of God. We're grateful for scripture. We're grateful for promises that though they may seem idealistic and out of reach, they remind us of the power of your spirit within us. Lord, I believe with everything in me, that Paul was not being flippant as he said to my heart today, do not be anxious about anything. So would you help me, help us to come after you in prayerful petition with thanksgiving in our hearts and trust and surrender. Would you help us to lean in and give away our perceived sense of control? Would you help us like my youngest child, to be calmed and find our peace and knowing that you are with us and that you are in control. And though we feel anxious, Lord, would you help us not to be anxious, but instead to be confident in what you're doing, to trust you in your goodness, to lean into your promises in every moment. We pray in your name, amen.